And the next speaker would be Dr. Mamo Muche. Uh, Dr. Mamo Muche is uh, very well known among many Ethiopians here, or almost all. But just to say a few words for our guests here. Uh, Dr. Mamo currently serves as principal lecturer and co-associate professor at Middlesex University. Uh, he used to be ECB chairman, and he is one of the veterans and the founders of this community. And uh, he still cooperates and uh, uh, gives us his kind help. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know whether this is a compliment or a punishment, because uh, for me to speak about the human rights, because my instinct is to talk about the politics of the country as a whole. And uh, I have a, uh, a profound critique about the direction that our country is, uh, is going. And obviously that is the sort of thing that naturally comes to me. So, but I have to sort of uh, discipline myself and sort of talk about the human rights situation in Ethiopia. <laughs> and I've been investigating as much as I can do. Uh, about uh, the human rights uh, reports from Amnesty, from African Watch, uh, from others. So the thought of thing I thought might be very useful to talk about today is to talk about two things. One is, uh, has the leopard changed its spot? Uh, has the EPDRF, which used to violate human rights before it came to power, has it changed its spots? Because I read uh, a report by Africa Watch on the eve of the accession to power by the EPDRF. That report was written on April 30, 1991. And they said that although the EPLF uh, and the EPDRF violation of human rights is not as gross as the military government, they certainly, wherever they controlled, in areas where they, you know, they controlled, they had a similar sort of autocratic, rather uh, abusive uh, strategy against the population in the regions they went. So, for example, uh, they said that report said that uh, in the towns that EPDRF controlled, teachers and students protested for two, you know, demanding, for example, that the country's unity should not be violated, and demanding that teachers demanding their salary should be increased. Those people were, uh, again, they were treated exactly as my our uh, friends from uh, Amnesty said. They were treated to uh, detention, uh, violations, and all sorts of uh, unlawful uh, victimizations. So that has happened prior to the coming of the power of the EPDRF. The point we'd like to ask is whether the leopard has changed its spot. And the reason why that question is a legitimate question is because when the EPDRF came to power, the, the, the reason why the international community supported the EPDRF was because it was going to Inter, in, into international norms. It was going to accept international standards. It was going to accept, to respect human rights, to, inter, to uh, respect the, the judicial independence, to respect free press, to respect free parliament and free elections. Those were the conditions. If you remember, we were here, most of you were here when we were protesting against the, the, the coming of the EPDRF because we knew what they were all about long before the others. But when we were protesting, the agreement, the, when the Americans said fine, Mr. Cohen said no cooperation, no democracy, no cooperation. That was what was said. Now, uh, now the idea is whether there is adequate international pressure, sufficient international pressure, to keep them on course. That is to say, to make them change their leopard skin, to make them do what is internationally acceptable. Is there? That's, and um, is there an adequate dom domestic pressure? Are there adequate citizens' activities, citizen groups, 
domestic groups who actually uh, watch human rights watches, active watchers, who actually make them force them or at least uh, uh, play on their, on, their, on, their, uh, on, on the bad side of their activities. The third point is the most important point, is how are the opposition behaving, the opposition movements? Are they also doing what must be done in order to also pressurize them sufficiently? Collectively, are all these forces working together? That is the point. Are the international forces working differently from all these other forces to create in Ethiopia a situation where, where all these international norms have to be accepted, where the EPDRF uh, will follow the norms that it was, when it got the power, it was, it, it was supposed to commit itself. Now, what did the EPDRF do? When it came to power, it did one thing, which we all must accept. On paper, it wrote into its statutes, into the rules, that it will commit itself to accepting all these norms. For example, the, international, the, human, the United Nations Human Rights Convention is accepted that. Uh, all the protocols, most of the protocols, with some exceptions, it has uh, signed to it. So it is accepted human rights, democratic freedoms, ex expression, movement, an independent judiciary, an independent parliament, pillars of a democratic society, accepted, all in paper. Now, there is what we call, in all transitional societies, it's nothing exceptional to Ethiopia, but all societies which had had totalitarian and semi-totalitarian or military communitarian traditions have had this particular anomaly, this particular difficulty, which is that they uh, have this democratic facade, but an autocratic practice. Now, what did the practice of the EPDRF tell us? First of all, EPDRF confuses itself as a party and as a government. The two are not clear to anybody. Mr. Malles sometimes acts as the EPDRF spokesman. He goes to the Council of Representatives, he acts, he spoke, speaks for the EPDRF. He is on the government, he speaks for, it's quite confusing. Um, and and that, that is not clarified. So sometimes the activities of the government, the activities of the EPDRF are not confused. A party is one party. The government, I theoretically, should speak for the whole nation, for the whole people. But that's not what's happening. Because sometimes the interest, in fact, of the EPDRF is much more pronounced in the government, in the Council of Representatives, in all spheres of the institution in that country, in all society. And that is a, a serious anomaly, a confusion. Number two. Narrow, uh, narrowing the scale and the range of reconciliation, healing the wounds of a society which has had extraordinary traumas. And the way EPDRF thinks of narrowing, of healing that, is by again pursuing its own sectional interest, its own vested interest, its own particular line. For example, it may not be prudent, if that is its line, to pursue ethnic pluralist politics. But it does. If that is not going to, if it's going to disaffect Ethiopian patriotic sentiment, it does not say, this is going to affect Ethiopian patriotic sentiment, and let's see if we can negotiate a new deal, which is acceptable to everybody. It won't say that. So the aims of reconciliation is strictly subordinate to the aims of its particularist politics. And again, that's a problem. It is, its, its structure is militarist, has not left the militarist mode. Its ways of doing things are militarist. It's secretive, it's uh, paranoid. Many, many cases, it's paranoid about the population it's, it's, it's in charge with, for example. It says things openly, uh, well, political activists from the EPDRF say, right of Addis Ababa, they will not, never support us. Right of all the people outside, because they never uh, will be listening to reason. Uh, they won't be, they will not support. Whatever we do, they won't support us, so ignore them. Let, what do we do? Let's fence off Addis Ababa from the rest of uh, the, the countryside, so that the countryside, the other part of the country, will not be affected by Addis Ababa's uh, politics. So whatever happens in Addis Ababa, control it. So if journalists write, 
let's not distribute the newspapers out into the countryside because that will then inflame other things. So the Adisawa's disease will be spreading. So keep Adisawa like a, 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 a prison, more or less. And that is the sort of thinking they have. Very, 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 extremely, extremely territorial. Very exclusivist they are. They wish to dominate the political process. They do not want to share it, to broaden it, so that the range of conciliation for the society which is badly needed is not on the agenda. What is the consequence from this stance, from this EPDRF stance? Consequences? The scale of human rights abuse from the time when they, before the, they came to power to now after they came to power, even after they committed themselves in paper for all the human rights situations, the scale has increased. What do I mean when the scale has increased? For two reasons. One, the situation for human right abuse, in other words, to displace human right abuse, the situation, the very rudimentary necessary conditions are not created. The EPDRF is, has been incapable of creating those conditions. Those conditions are, one, allowing, allowing or protecting particularly minorities, particularly people or citizens who are unsympathetic to their politics. That's a key, key criteria particularly opposition movements. Those have to be protected by law. They, this is a pillar and the most elementary understanding of democracy, is to protect those who are not in power. They are in power. They don't need very much protection. I mean, they, they, as it is, they need protection. So they have the army, and they, they go to Al-Sarawa, and they are, they are like Mangistu al and they are protected by everybody. Why should they need protection from the population if the population is free and accepts them? But they are not. That's why they have they, they needed the protection. The who needs the protection is the minorities who have different views about the, the nature of society. So what are they engaged in? I don't want to repeat it. You've heard it from Af uh, my friend here, who sat here before. I'm sorry, his name I just forgot. Yes, Rahani, and you've heard it from Amnesty. They're engaged in all the standard techniques of all authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. Extra judicial execution rearresting people who have been cleared by courts by using injection from law courts. That, what does it say about the authority of courts? When the Supreme Court decides to free someone, like for example a peace emissary here uh, uh, from Kodef, and a law court, and the EPDRF tells a law court to, to put him back in jail, what does it say to building institutions, to building structures, to create a rule of law, not a rule of persons, to eliminate arbitrary, <coughs> arbitrary power. What does it say about creating a system of governance, a system of institutions? Nothing. That is the problem in our country. We don't want arbitrary, arbitrary, arbitrary decisions made by the whims of people. We want system of government, which a procedural rationality of some sort. Which, which replace good, substantive rationality. That's all we want. We want that some sort of c conjunction which creates this system. It's not happening. They violate the same rule. This is extraordinary. When somebody says this, when somebody just says this, killing prisoners in unexplained circumstances. For example, I, uh, it's correct maybe to put uh, the Mengistu uh, people in jail uh, for, uh, and, and put them into, into human rights, uh, whatever law, but there should be clear defense. They should also say what, whether they, they can, can get out of it. If they haven't done it, we don't know. That has to be done by law, by, by, by pure law. But what did they do? Some of them have been eliminated. They have disappeared. They have not been accounted for. That is the practice that used to be under Mengistu. They are repeating it. So what do we say about those people? How do we inform their, their families and so on and so forth? And is it correct to do that? Detaining illegal detention of people and uh, dismissing people from jobs, particularly Amharas, particularly targeting certain groups. Particularly a, a group of the Amhara people are targeted. Constantly they are attacked called Timkitenya. Somebody told me, one of the people who actually was working for them told me that uh, the Amhara, he was uh, in that organization called the Amhara People's Democratic Movement, 
which Tamrat Lenny runs. And in all the meeting, he counted about 160 or something, or 170 times, when everybody who came and spoke talked about Amharas as Timtinians. And they are standing for Amhara. How can they stand for Amhara and, and condemn the Amharas? Precisely this kind of double speak, this Orwellian speak that we, we, uh, people are against, and uh, and again violating the, the sanctity of the church in our society, in our culture, or in every European or any other culture. The church is a sanctuary. You don't violate the church. You wait. If there is a criminal in the church, you wait. You wait until you bid your time. You're the state. You're the power. You don't. He does uh, violate it. What did they do when they attacked the church in Gonda? They violated the church. It's not simply the attack and the killing of people. It's the sacredness, the, the, the whole culture, the hitting, the psychological undermine, under, you know, the undermining of the psychology of a whole nation, of a belief in, in its tradition, in its institutions, in its, in its uh, spirituality. It's that they attacked. And it's not something that will go well. The people there will never forget this for many, 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 many years. I tell you, it's something that will go on and on, being replayed, being, you know, for many, many generations. And they are doing that. They are attacking the church. This is not only done in Gonda. It's also done in Magali. In Magali, Magali is what, where they rule. They attack the church. They also did exactly the same thing in the church, although the scale is not as high as in Gonda. Now, as far as freedom is concerned, Freedom of expression, in words, yes. Again, journalists, harass, cartel distribution. Uh, freedom of the artists. The nation has lost all its artists now. Most of them actually are here now. I've got, we've got 10 people here, extremely fantastic artists, who, if we support them, could, could probably build Ethiopia, Ethiopia's reputation very much. There's Rabudin here, they have, we've got them here. We have to work to get them actually to be a, a fantastic group. And why we lost the nation lost it. They are alienated from their circumstance. That's the soil from which they bring out their artistic flower, the beauty, and the, all the expression, the poetry. All that is now gone. We're now in this context. We need to recreate it from the exile setup. They are here. The artists are here. I have seen them. I have talked to them. I, extraordinary, I have extraordinary admiration for them. We have brought them here. Not only here. In America too. The key singers like uh, Alham Giza, all, uh, Al -Han, uh, I guess I said others, they are all outside. The nation is bereft of the artists. What is happening to the artists? Because they believe art as an instrument of ideology, art as an instrument of power. They want, again, the APDRF wants, wants the artists to do its bidding. If they don't do it, they say, we will not support you. Okay? We will not give you any support, and they get harassed. So what do the artists do? What do they choose? Flee. <coughs> so there is no better evidence of, for the stifling of free expression of ideas than what's happening to the creative arts of Ethiopia, says a report by uh, the Human Rights Organization in Ethiopia. And that is very bad. When you attack people of expression, freedom of press, and when you attack election, two things, you have no democracy. And we cannot, well, for whatever reason, it cannot qualify for a democratic uh, situation. Now, if someone faints sleep, you can't wake him. You can't wake him up. The problem we face now is that the international community is asleep. When it comes to the EPDRF, particularly the United States and the Britain, because they connived in the setting up of this particular settlement in Ethiopia, they are asleep. And they do not want to wake up to our reality. And our reality is this reality of detentions, executions, as the Amnesty uh, uh, friend said, a pattern is emerging. A pattern which is not different, which is not inconsistent if you understand the EPDRF uh, politics. It's a pattern, which is it's a system, a system which which you can see from all the variety of forms 
of, uh, of human rights violations tell you that it is not an accident, it's a systematic pattern. This pattern of violations of human rights is not something that you can sleep about. It's not something you can say, okay, in Ethiopia there is no human rights violation. This is what the State Department said. I have a quote here for you. It said in Ethiopia uh, in 1993, there, is, there were no reports of officially sanctioned political or other extrajudicial killing by the TGE or the Transitional Government of Ethiopia security forces or by the opposition in 1993. As far as the American State Department is concerned, Ethiopia is very nice. It's an angelic society with no problem. That's what they said. This is in 1993. Now, I'm, this is a very important problem. We are faced with death here, and we have a difficult problem of making sure that they understand that the reality in Ethiopia is a very complicated one. We must be able to explain to them that Ethiopian patriotism is under attack. Ethiopia, at the moment, you cannot, no society in the world has thrived, has developed, when its confidence, when its confidence is every day, by press, by government, by everybody, is under attack. It cannot thrive. Britain has a patriotic element, everybody has a patriotic element. Why should we be denied that right to be patriotic in our own country? Why should we be denied that? Why should self-determination, however that's understood, be much more important, for whatever reason, ethnic pluralism, much more important than Ethiopian patriotism? That cannot be something we will, we will, we will die easily. And for us, for those of us who, who would like to be patriotic, to reclaim Ethiopia's lost dignity, to reclaim its liberty, to, to announce it and to proudly say it, we should say it, we should continue to do it, Human rights violations, our rights will be violated. Ethiopia's rights have been violated. Nothing is more, more worse than that. So this is going to continue. A struggle is going to continue. I'm saying this. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying this. The friend earlier on told us in Ogaden, the election is going to go on. But the election in Ogaden will not go on as it goes on in January 1995 in Ethiopia. Why? Because Ogaden is, there's a military struggle going on there. There's a military struggle going on. In other places, a military struggle will come soon. That is going to happen. And I wish nothing worse for, for Ethiopia than a military struggle, given all its problems. And if there is any responsibility that should go, it must go to the EPDRF, EPLF, and those, those who are asleep, the people, the international people, particularly America, 